Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we also received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, call the saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if you will, if you want to turn in your Bibles to chapter 12, actually we're going to head there this morning and come back to chapter 1. We're going to start looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 7, but we're going to head over to chapter 12. But <clears throat> and I'm going to sort of back our way into this epistle a little bit. And there's reason for this, but if I could title this message, it would be titled Transform to Serve. And really that's the direction that Paul leads us in Romans as he takes us into chapter 12. And he begins in chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, <clears throat> so that you will prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Really, essentially, what Paul is dealing with is the issue of transform. He's talking about the transformation within, about this revival, about a reformation, but to be transformed by the truths. And really, when you look at chapters 1 through 11, we have all of this doctrine laid out for us, but he's all, always moving towards chapter 12 to this element of transformation, that somehow these truths must change our life. And really that transformation is not so much for our own benefit and our own growth, but it's for the sake of service. And this book, I mean, this is why I came to it, really, is the issue of transformation. I really wanted to spend some time focusing on the gospel, and so we went to Galatians, and now we're going to spend some time in Romans. And Galatians, we went there just to sort of get a precursor, because there's a lot in Galatians chapter 1 that tells us about the life of Paul, the background, his history a little bit. And we took a look at Galatians, but more of an overview. I want to start getting into the details of Romans, but I want to understand the gospel from the Word of God and to understand that which really transformed Paul's life and was something major in his life. I mean, you think about it. I mean, you think about his life when he recounts it in 2 Corinthians 11, that he had been beaten numerous times, stoned, left for dead, suffered shipwrecked. He had been if you will, he had deprived himself of food and sleep. He had been persecuted. He had been rejected. He had subjected himself by going to territories that were not places that people would want to really journey to. But he had suffered, if you will, at the hands of robbers and all of this kinds of stuff. And he had gone through all of these things. And you sit and you ask yourself, why would a man subject himself to such experiences in life and negative ones at that. I mean, to the point that he would even be stoned and left for dead. Why would someone do that? And the reality of it is it's all about the gospel. Or you think about the 12 who followed Jesus Christ and they left their jobs and they left their families. And understand this, most of them walked away their families for a period of three years to follow Jesus wherever he went. Why would a group of men walk away from their business, Levi, Matthew especially, because he was a tax collector, he couldn't return to his job. Why would he walk away from that to follow Jesus, leave everything behind and follow him for three years? Why would he do that? Why would they forsake family, home, and everything to follow a carpenter's son all over the place? It was the issue of the gospel. And I really have been challenged for myself going through Romans is the issue of this transformation that comes. And this is an amazing letter. I was reflecting recently on the Wesleys. And it's interesting because in May of 24, 1738, there was a discouraged missionary. And, and he was very discouraged. And he reluctantly went into this meeting that was in London on Aldersgate Street. And he walked into this meeting, but it was a transforming moment for him. But he was discouraged in regards to ministry and that. But he walks into this meeting, and this is what this missionary wrote. He said, about a quarter before nine, I felt my heart strangely warmed, and I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. Now, it's interesting because he wrote in his same, if you will, his same journal, John Wesley, John Wesley, 
He wrote this a few months earlier. He says, I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? He and his brother actually journeyed to America and they came to Georgia specifically and they were going to share the gospel with these Indians and they wanted to convert them. But the reality of it was that John Wesley had not tasted of God's graciousness. He had not experienced justification through faith. And so therefore he was very discouraged because it was all religiosity for him until he came to this meeting at Aldersgate in London and all of a sudden he heard the truth that set him free and he experienced the amazing grace of God and the message that came and the transformation came when he heard the preface to Martin Luther's commentary on Romans. Changed his life radically. It brought about such amazing transformation. And this led to the Wesleyan revivals that spread all the way through England. He and his brother traveled everywhere preaching the gospel. And that's what they were all about. But it was all because of this one moment in his life when he heard the preface to, to Luther's commentary on Romans. He was set free. Amazing thing is that when you think about John Wesley and the revival, I mean, the, the impact that he had, I mean, even in the local papers when he died in the obituaries, they couldn't help but acknowledge the fact of the transformation that he brought to a nation just because of the truth that came from this one letter right here, Romans. When I mean, you think about Martin Luther's life, transforming texts for him that really brought him out of this mere religion into experience of salvation by grace through faith was Romans the last part of verse 17, the just shall live by faith. Six works from Habakkuk, and those words transformed Martin Luther's life and led to the Reformation. Such amazing impact that this one letter has on the lives of people. The reality of it is, is that there can be revival, and there can be Reformation in our hearts, in our homes. There can be this in our communities, there can be this in this nation. It's just the gospel. It's the gospel. It changes lives. And that's what it's intended to do is to bring about this transformation. And that's really what it is. It's about total transformation. And I take you to chapter 12 because <clears throat> it's interesting. In chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, this is what Paul has been leading us to. And I love this passage, and I, and I quoted this from Mool, and I, I love Mool at times. He just has some amazing thoughts. But this is his thought, and as he's coming out of chapters 1 through 11, and all of the doctrine, all the theology, as he makes this transition, his commentary into chapter 12, this is what he says. He says, As out of the sun cleft in the face of the rocky hills rolls the pure stream born in their depths, and runs under the sun and sky through the green meadows and beside the thirsty homes of men, so here from the inmost mysteries of grace comes a message of all comprehensive holy duty. The Christian, filled with the knowledge of an eternal love, is told not to dream but to serve with all the mercies of God for his motive. I mean, everything really that Paul dwells with in chapter 12, verse 1, is going back to everything he's dealt with in the earlier part of this letter. Now I want to set some context for you. This is important to understand how this book fits together. And I wanted to back into this. I'm going to start in chapter 12, and then we're going to go back to chapter 1. And we're only going to look at chapter 1, verse 1 this morning. That's it. But I wanted to back into this because I want to show you the flow of this whole letter. And we've looked at this before. Paul's going to deal with a series of themes and topics, and he's going to roll one from the next. And they're all tied together. They're all interconnected. And they all have to do with God's righteousness. And we saw this last week. 34 times he used the word in this letter. 34 times. The second closest is 2 Corinthians. He uses the word righteousness seven times. So that tells us that righteousness is an important term, if you will, when it comes to the book of Romans. But if we can look at the first part, 118 through 320, he's going to deal with the issue of sin, and it's going to deal with the unrighteousness of all mankind, and it's God's righteousness revealed in condemnation. Then he's going to move to salvation. That's 321 through 521. And I'll just tell you, 321 through 26, it's the heart of this whole letter. The heart of this whole letter. Martin Luther said it's the heart of all of Scripture. But here he's going to deal with the imputation of righteousness, God's righteousness revealed in justification. And I know some of these terms scare us. They're theological terms. They're crucial terms. There are theologians today, quote unquote, Christian theologians are suggesting that the doctrine of justification has no pertinence to us as the church today. Hogwash. It is a key doctrine for the church. Blood has been spilt over it, lives have been sacrificed for it, and it is still crucial for us today to understand justification by faith. 
And we looked at that before when Paul talks about the power of the gospel of God to change lives. But it's only because it manifests His righteousness. If it doesn't have that, there's no power. There's no power. And therefore, we should be ashamed. But Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God, because in it is revealed the righteousness of God. He's going to move us from salvation to sanctification. He doesn't leave us hanging, all right? We don't sit back in our spiritual lazy chairs and say, okay, I'm saved and I do nothing. No, there is a process of growth in our life, and so he's going to deal with the impartation of righteousness, and it's God's righteousness revealed in sanctification. Then he's moved to sovereignty, the defense of God's righteousness, and here he's going to deal with the nation of Israel, but it's God's righteousness revealed in sovereign choice. Why has the nation of Israel been set aside for a time so that he may save all? And then he's going to come to service 12, 1 through 15, 13, the practice of righteousness, God's righteousness revealed and transformed living. And I'll just tell you in 12, 1, that is the hinge of the book. It really is. And Paul does this oftentimes in his letters. But this is the hinge, the mercies of God. And everything that he dwells with in chapters 1 through 11, it is the mercies of God. That word, therefore, in 12, 1, looks back to everything he's written up to this point. Some suggest to the end of chapter 11, grammatically, I'm sorry, doesn't happen. It's to everything he's written in chapters 1 through 11. And the reality is this, and I'll just give you this thought, something for you to dwell on in your own time of reading through Romans. We can only understand the true nature and extent of God's mercy when we truly understand several things. First, we need to understand our sinfulness. We need to understand our salvation. We need to understand our sanctification. We need to understand God's sovereignty. If we understand these things, then we will understand God's mercy. I mean, really, that's what chapters 1 through 11 are, a preface to chapter 12 and following. But we won't know how to behave unless we know all of these truths. We won't be able to appreciate the mercies of God unless we understand just how depraved we were and the work that He has done in our life and all that He has provided for us. So if I could capsulize it this way, looking at the major sections... If we do not understand the nature and extent of our sinfulness, we will never understand the nature and extent of God's mercies. Thus, we will not understand the nature and extent of our responsibilities before God. This is what I tell guys, when we're preaching through these books, you can't go to the practical, the application part, until you deal with the doctrinal part, because that everything is based off of that. That's like trying to have a full understanding of the New Testament without studying the Old Testament. You can't do it, because it sets the base, the foundation, foreshadows everything that is to come. If we do not understand, if we want to understand the nature and extent of our salvation, we will never understand the nature and extent of God's mercies, and thus we will not understand the nature and extent of our responsibility before God. If we don't understand our sanctification, if we don't understand God's sovereignty, we will not understand the mercies of God, and we will not understand our responsibilities before God. These are things that we need to understand before we get to chapter 12 and not understanding how to live our life. All of these are things are crucial. For those who are visual, I give you this. Cheesy as it may be, this is chapter 12, verse 1. It's the hinge to the book. And I love this because Paul does this often. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, it's interesting because he does the same thing there. But I love the word hagios. Hagios. It means to balance the scales. So in chapter 4, of verse 1, when he says, Walk in a manner worthy of your calling, he says, Balance the scales, right? Here is your position in Christ. Now your life should be balanced with your position in Christ. He's going to do a similar thing here in Romans. He's going to give us this hinge off of everything that, that is built up at this point. So let me give you the thought, if I could, tie it all together. One word, un. This is just every term is important. Every one. But just follow me. So Paul's going to talk about the mercies of God, all right? So let's lay it out. And then he's going to talk about the, the present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So the first part of the letter is God's provision. Second part is our responsibility. So this is what God has done. This is what you need to do, okay? That's our motivation. When we know what God has provided for us, then we understand what we're supposed to do. So here we go. In our sinfulness, God provided in His sovereignty, if you will, salvation and sanctification. That's the first part of the letter. In our sinfulness, God provided in His sovereignty salvation and sanctification. Then He's going to come to chapters 12 and following. We are therefore to respond with service, 12, 3 through 8, sacrificial love, submission to authority, and self-denial. See, this is the natural outgrowth of understanding these truths in chapters 1 through 11. 
And it is our responsibility then to respond to those truths by living in such a way. So the whole focus is about transformation. It's about a transformed life, but it's a transformed life to serve. And you realize that when you read chapters 12 and following, everything there is focused on primarily love. Love. Chapter 12, chapter 13, even when he deals with our relationship to the government and our relationship to society at large, at the heart of it is love. So this is the book of Romans, if you will. I take you back to chapter 1. And we are going to look at the salutation. And I have said before, we're just going to walk through this <clears throat> phrase by phrase, verse by verse. And we're going to look at chapter 1, verse 1 this morning. And I, and I do this often when I go through and study these books. We lay out the context for you so we understand what's happening here. But what's amazing is that Paul introduces himself in chapter 1, verse 1. And he is going to introduce himself and really essentially introduces himself as the, the preacher of a worldwide gospel. And that really is what it is. In chapter 1, verse 14, notice with me, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to the foolish. I am proclaiming a gospel that is suitable to every moral and national condition. And I am burdened to do this. And so it's in this vein that he is going to come to Rome. So chapter 1, verse 15, he says, So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Because of this obligation, responsibility, that I have a worldwide gospel, I'm also coming to you. And really what he's going to reveal in this letter is that he wants to come to them. He's going to spend some time with them, but he wants them to help him get on to Spain. He's got mission field in mind. And that's the beautiful thing about Paul is he's always got the vision of the harvest. I want that stirred up in me again. I spend much time with my kids going through the gospel of just having that vision for the lost and the vision that Christ had when He came into this world to save sinners and the vision that the Apostle Paul had. He was always looking for the mission field. He'll say in chapter 15, I don't want to build on another man's foundation. I'm always looking for open territory, places where I can take the gospel when no one has ever heard it before. See, this should be the heartbeat of the church. This should be our drive. If we understand the gospel message from Romans and our life has been changed by that, we should be like John Wesley. And we should be, if you will, ablaze with fire from this message of the gospel to go out into the world and tell everyone about this hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Somehow it should stir us up. Paul's going to lay out several things for us in chapter 1. He's going to summarize the scriptures as a whole. In 1, 2, he's going to summarize his ministry labors, if you will, and he's going to outline the religious history of the Gentile world. And if I could, if you will, outline chapter 1, I'll give it to you briefly, but we'll just start walking through it. The first part we're going to look in 1, 1 through 7, but Paul gives us his official declaration. Then he gives his personal affection. He's going to appeal to them and to share with them his heart and his burden to come and visit them. He gives his official confirmation. Then he's going to lay out the, the history of the pagan world and their condemnation. Several things he's going to deal with is the wrath of God revealed and the wrath of God deserved. And it's threefold. The reason why the wrath of God, and it's being poured out now. It's not just future, it's now. Being poured out on man. And the reasons for this are threefold. For suppressing God's truth, for ignoring God's revelation, and for per perverting God's glory. We talked about last week, there is no one without excuse. There's no one who has an excuse for not knowing that God exists. Every man is suppressing the truth around him. God has made it so evident that he exists. So when we look around us, man is just suppressing that truth. He's ignoring God's revelation and he's perverting God's glory. And then he's going to deal with the wrath of God inflicted, abandoned to depraved heart, abandoned to depraved passions, and if we will, abandoned to depraved mind. But I bring you to this part right here, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. This is an amazing salutation. And I, I will I'll take Amy's uh, suggestion. I, one of these days I may write a book on the Pauline salutations. They're amazing to me. This one's amazing because this is the longest one in all of his letters. This has, if you will, it consists of 12 lines in the Greek text, 93 words. This is the longest out of all salutations. The closest is Galatians and then comes Titus. Titus, three chapters. 65 words. Longest salutation in his letters. And it's amazing because notice what happens in chapter 1, verse 2. He says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. 
This is great because really what he has is he has this greeting, and it consists of two verses essentially, verse 1 and verse 7. So in verse 1, Paul introduces himself. In verse 7, he comes back to the salutation again. Notice with me, To all who are beloved of God in Rome, call the saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 2 through 6 are a parenthesis. So, so Paul starts talking, then he breaks off from 2 through 6, and then he comes back to his point again in verse 7. He always does this. Now, NIV is interesting because they'll do this. They put that little dash right there because they tell you this is a parenthesis. It's just one word, which. Relative pronoun. Grammar's great. I love grammar. Grammar's great because with this one relative pronoun, which, Paul is going to break into the gospel message. And he is going to give us some amazing truth in just a few verses. And as he gives us the gospel message, he's going to give us the content of that message, and it is the Son of God. And that's the gospel in a nutshell. It's about the Son of God. We looked at this Galatians, right? One verse, chapter 1, verse 4. We had the gospel all contained essentially in one verse. We're going to get the same thing we come to Romans. And Paul's going to build off this. And so he's going to detour when he talks about the gospel. And he's going to come back to his salutation again in verse 7. <clears throat> the reason for the salutation is threefold. I give it to you. One, he didn't plant this church. This is interesting. I, I was going to title the first message I preached on Romans, I was going to title the, the letter that Paul never wrote. Paul wrote this letter, but he didn't actually write this letter. He had an amanuensis who wrote it, and he gives his greeting at the end. Paul would dictate to him, and he wrote down what Paul said. Paul didn't actually write this. He just spoke it. That's why we have those breaks that happen and those parentheses that come. But he didn't plant this church. And there are a lot of speculations as to how this church was planted. Some take it back to, to Acts when Peter preached the message right on the day of Pentecost, and there were those who were there who received the gospel. They went back to Rome, and they started sharing the gospel, and the church was planted by Jewish believers, quite possibly so. I definitely do not even think that Peter planted this church. It's impossible when we look at the history in the, in the, in the New Testament as to his travels and so on. But Paul didn't plant this church, and so he's writing to it and introducing himself to them. He didn't know them in a face-to-face -face way, although you look at chapter 16, that long list of just greetings, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so, greet so-and-so. He was known there, but he'd never seen them face-to-face. -face. So therefore, he has to introduce himself and let them know why he's writing and who is writing and, and that he has the authority to write, and he hoped to visit the church, and so he's prepping them. I'm coming. I want to go to Spain. I want you to help me. Can you imagine that writing, writing to a church and saying, okay, I had this vision for the mission field. I want to go here overseas and I want to come by because I want you to help me get there. Churches nowadays would be going, I don't think so, man. But Paul wanted to prep them because he wanted to come visit. He wanted to spend some time doing ministry there, but he wanted to head on to Spain. He wanted them to help him. The content of the salutation, he's going to give the def definition to his mission and then the gospel message. And so I want to get in that this morning. And several things that Paul is going to deal with in these few verses is the first one is God's messenger. He's going to deal with God's gospel, God's son, and then he's going to go to God's people. And these are the elements that we're going to look at. But just this morning, God's messenger. There's some amazing truth here. I mean, the thing, you know, we looked at Galatians and Paul, he starts off in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, Paul. I mean, this is my name, and it's great because you realize that the truth is coming through a human conduit. All of his emotions and everything else and, and all of his personality is being poured out in this letter as he writes it, although it is the Word of God and the Spirit of God is directing him and leading him. He uses personalities, and so we find this in Paul's letter, and we get a sense of Paul's heart for the gospel. That he can't even mention the gospel of God at the end of verse 1 without breaking into verses 2 through 6 and talk about this gospel. I can't even say it, and now all of a sudden I've got to tell you about it, although I just want to get on with, the, if you will, the, the formalities of saying hi and hear who I am and who, who I'm writing to and so on, and then I want to get on to my, my intent on coming to you, but he can't even do that. He's carried away by the statement of the fact that it is the gospel of God that he goes off into this parenthesis to talk about it. It's a man. It's a man, but it's a man whose life has been transformed by the message of Jesus Christ. And sometimes I sit and I look and I think, you know, <clears throat> what am I doing? It's like when I talked about Dr. Grenfeld when he met D.L. Moody. He came to greet D.L. Moody and to, to introduce himself to him because he came to Christ as a result of D.L. Moody's message one time when he went to an open-air meeting and he had never meet, met him before, so he comes to him 14 years later after he accepted Christ. And the first encounter he has with D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody says, So, 
What have you been doing since? That's great you're saved, so what have you been doing since? How have you been serving God? How have you been working out your salvation? I'm just challenged when I come and I look at the life of this man. This was a man who was sold out for the gospel. And this is great because there's three, three ways that he describes himself in verse 1. And they have every pertinence to us. The first one is, he is a servant of Christ Jesus. And I'm going to use Paul's method through Romans. He asks questions and he answers them. So that's why I'm going to do my outline this morning. But the first question I have is, how, how significant is this description? Take it grammatically. Okay? Gramma, grammar is everything. It really is. My dad always said grammar rules. It does. This is great. There are three statements that are in apposition to Paul loss. Paul. All of them are in the same case, nominative case, and they all define Paul loss. The first one is this. I am a servant of Christ Jesus. Now, I stop and ask myself, I mean, this is the first appositional description that he gives. Just ask yourself, if you were asked to give a description of yourself, what would be the first thing you would say? What would be the first thing that you would say as you defined your life? So if someone sat you down and said, okay, Bill, who are you? What would you say? Dan, who are you? What would be the first thing that you would tell them? I am what? This is Paul's first choice. And this isn't just, you know, we translate it servant, bond servant. This is slave, doulos. In other words, I don't even belong to myself. I'm a possession of somebody else. I'm not a man who's driven by my own will. I'm a man who's driven by the will of somebody else. I'm not a man who's driven by my own desires and pleasures. I'm a man who's driven by the desires and pleasures of someone else. I am a slave to a master. And that master is Christ Jesus. This is the first thing that Paul uses to define his life to a people who've never met him before. I want to induce myself, and this is it. I'm a slave. Is that how we would define ourselves? I'm a slave. It's interesting because personally, he uses this over and over in his letters. <laughs> This is one of his favorite designations. When you look at Philippians, he's writing to a church that knows him. And so therefore, he doesn't have to say that he's an apostle. They already know that. And there's such an intimate bond between them. And so here's a man who's going right out of his heart. And that's what he does. When you read Philippians, you read Paul's heart all the way through that letter. You know how he designates himself in that letter as he writes to them, Paul, a slave of Christ. That's his favorite designation. The great thing about this is when you realize the background, okay, culturally, Rome, I'll give you this, Rome, there were about 60 million slaves suggested in the Roman Empire. The majority of the populace was slaves. In a typical Roman household, they would have several slaves and each one would be given their, their designated work and, if you will, dominion of oversight. Some of the, the more richy homes, those who had, could afford more slaves, the slave would be the doctor, the family physician. If they had a library, they had a slave that oversaw the library, and they were in charge of that. If you had children, you had a slave who was in charge of instructing your children. They were the, the, the master, the, the instructor. But each slave had their designated area. The great thing by this is Paul writes to this Roman church, to Gentiles who understood the Roman Empire. They lived in the capital. They understood this term slave when Paul used it. They understood that Paul was putting himself on the same level as every other believer out there. We are all slaves of Christ. And he does. This is one of his favorite designations to use of every Christian. He uses this in Romans. Paul is not just a slave. We are slaves. Now, if they would read this, they would understand. Slave market, we don't have that. But they had that in those days. They had a slave market. And so you would go there if you wanted to buy more slaves for your household. And you would go into this market and you would have the auction. And they would bring the slaves up and they would present them before the crowds and people would bid and then they would purchase a slave and they would take them home. Paul often draws off of this imagery when he talks about the fact that we have been purchased, that we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. He bought us out of the slave market. So when Paul uses this term, this Roman church, they understand what he's saying by this reference to him being a slave, that he was purchased by Christ, that the price was paid by his blood. He is, if you will, he is a bought slave from the market, and he belongs to Christ now. He is his owner, his master. It's the reality for all of us. But see, for the Grecian mind, this, this was unacceptable. You did not refer to yourself as a slave. 
For the Grecian mind, we're free, we're, we're, we're capable of serving our own wills and being our own masters and fulfilling our own desires. And Paul says, no, as a believer, you are a slave of Christ because he bought you. I mean, just to understand that fact, do we realize that we don't belong to ourselves? We don't belong to ourselves. He paid the price. He bought us. He delivered us out of that slave market, out of slavery to sin, out of slavery to Satan, out of slavery to the power of sin in our life and our sinful natures. He bought us out of that, and we now belong to Him. That should be the first designation we give anybody when they ask us, Who are you? I'm a slave of Christ. I'm a slave of Christ. In this society, it's not acceptable either, right? It's not acceptable to be a slave of somebody else. It's not acceptable to say, you know what? My life isn't driven by my will. My life is driven by a will of another. And it's interesting because when you look at the life of Paul, there's no doubt his life was driven by the will of someone else. What is the meaning of this description? Just to lay it out for you, the understanding of this term, the phrase connotes total devotion, suggesting that the servant is completely at the disposal of his Lord. You see, with the Roman slave, there was no freedom. They, they, they couldn't think for themselves, do for themselves. Whatever the master said, that's what they did. And I give you this thought. The word is pointing to unconditional commitment. The goal of redemption is obedience rather than autonomy. But see, this is how we understand redemption. We think it's just about autonomy. I can do whatever I want to do. It's not. It's about obedience. You see, in the church, we think that we have the freedom to do whatever we jolly well please, and we have the autonomy to do whatever we like. We don't. We've been bought. We've been purchased. We belong to a master. He dictates to us. It's His will that should drive everything about us. That's why we should always go here, not somewhere else, because we need to understand what He wants us to do. It is about total devotion. It's about total belongingness. I said total belongingness. I just ask myself this week, do I totally belong to Christ? Do I totally belong to Christ? I mean, just think about this. Are there dimensions in my life that I'm holding back from Him? Are there areas in my life where I'm just saying, okay, Lord, you can have this, but not this, not this. This is mine. And see, what if he's instructing me from his word as to what I'm supposed to be doing, and I just say, you know what? I just can't do that. That's not me. Then the problem is we're not serving the will of our master. And we're not reflecting total belongingness. It is a total allegiance which comes from absolute ownership and authority. You see, Paul, he could go everywhere, did everything. It was all about the gospel. It was about serving his Lord and Master. He loved Christ so much he wanted to be with Christ. He was in so in love with his Master that, you know, when we read in Philippians, right? For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. This was the most cherished relationship that Paul had in his life. Out of all relationships, this was it. He was a slave to Christ. Can we say that in our lives? And if someone were to look at our life, do we even need to say it? Could they see that in how we live our life? The decisions we make, the things that we do, the attitudes that we take on, do we reflect that of our master? Or is there some other will we're serving? I love this thought by Moore. He says, to be a bondservant is a terrible in the abstract. To be Christ's bondservant is paradise in concrete. Self-surrender taken alone is a plunge into a cold void. When I mean, you think of Buddhists and these monks that go off to live on top of a mountain somewhere in a life of self-surrender, but in the end it's completely empty. But man, if you live a life surrendered to Christ, it's paradise. For Paul, it was paradise to live a life of self-surrender to Christ because that was the most cherished relationship he had. And he had no trouble surrendering himself to him because, you know what? He understood the first 11 chapters. To some degree, he understood the truth of what Christ did for him, that he purchased him and all that God had done. And therefore, he had no trouble saying, this is my life. I give it to you. Use it however you want. 
He had no trouble, 12-1 and following, right, to offer his life up as a living sacrifice, acceptable to God. So, I mean, that's the response that he's moving to, right? So when we start looking at what God tells us about how he wants us to live our life, are we offering up our lives as a living sacrifice to God? We're willing to surrender it all. Mool goes on to say, when it is surrendered to the Son of God who loved and gave himself for me, it is the bright homecoming of the soul to the seat and sphere of life and power. I just, that, that can't even word it any better than that, but that's just the reality of it for Paul. You see, him surrendering his life to Christ, it was a sweet surrender. It was his love and joy and his delight to serve his master in whatever way he wanted. And all the affliction that he went through, the suffering, the pain, the agony, all of that he had experienced physically. And remember, he, Paul is just a mere man, although he's an apostle, a mere man. And all that he went through was for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it brought him delight to serve his master in such a way. Can we really say that we have each one sweetly surrendered our life to our master? I still think back, every time I think of Dulas, I think of Mary. I was talking about well, the other day with one of my kids, we were talking about Mary, you know, and they were giving their observations, you know, because here she was engaged to be married, and that was binding, just as binding as marriage was. But they were talking about the fact that, you know, here she's, she's pregnant and she's not even been with Joseph yet, right? And they were drawing the understanding of the situation that she was going to suffer persecution for that, absolutely. I mean, people weren't looking upon her favorably. Wouldn't someone typically get stoned to death for that kind of thing, that in kind of moral relationship? Yes. The angel comes and says, this is what's going to happen to you. You've got to know she knows what's going to happen in her life. And the, all of the burden that's going to become upon her because of the fact that she's going to have this child, she's going to conceive, and yet she hasn't been with Joseph yet, and everybody's going to know. And even Joseph, he wants to put her away, but she knows all of that stuff's going to come. And you know what her response is? Let it be to me as you have said. Behold, your bondservant. You see, this is the hard attitude I want to have every time I come to the Word of God and it tells me what God wants me to do. I want to respond with, Behold your bondservant. May it be done to me as you have said. That was Paul's life. It's Paul's life. The next description is he is a called apostle. <clears throat> And this is interesting because we understand apostles, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about that. But first he establishes his master, now he's going to establish his ministerial position. He is an apostolos, if you will, but I don't want to focus on apostle because we've talked about this before. Apostle means sent one, and there was the technical way in which it was used, and it was used to Paul and the twelve. Others are referred to as apostles. We have those referenced in chapter 16 of this particular letter. They're referred to as apostles, and it's referring to them as an issue of missionaries because it can be used in that way. But Paul was a distinct apostle. And the way that he defines himself makes it very clear that he is putting himself on the par with the twelve. Galatians, we looked at Galatians, and as he gave a defense for his ministry, he was putting himself on equal footing with the twelve. And so what he claims about his apostleship is not like a missionary. It's not like Epaphroditus who was sent from Philippi as an apostolos, as a messenger on their behalf, to speak on their behalf, to minister to Paul on their behalf. He's saying something very distinct and unique about himself in this case. But I wanted to focus on this term right here, kletos. Now, how is the term call used? And it's really, this is where we actually get our English word call from. And that's really what it is in the Greek. The Greek, they start off, it's like Hebrew, it was a triliteral root system. So they had three root letters, and then they would take those three root letters, and they would put prefixes and suffixes. And in Hebrew, they put infixes, and they would change the, the structure of the word. And then three root letters, they could take and make different words out of it. And that is really what Paul is going to do here, because he's going to use a verbal adjective, but it's built off of the same triliteral root letter. It's a verbal adjective, kletos, and it's derived from kaleo. So I'll give you different forms in which we find it. We have kaleo, I call. We have kletos, which is divinely called. And we have klesis, which is a divine call or invitation. Paul likes to use this term, if you will. And the, the definition of it, if you will, going back to classical Greek period, the term meant invited, welcome, guest, where the invitation conferred special honors, the word came to mean chosen. 
So this is a pretty heavy term, and Paul likes to use it, especially in Romans and 1 Corinthians. This idea of clases is associated with the callings of Old Testament prophets, according to Robertson and Plummer, who are very well-known Greek scholars, and so I would take them at their word, not to mention I've also done the study, and it is true. In the Septuagint, this is how it would be used. Kalein was used in the New Testament in a technical sense to note a way in which God appoints men to salvation or to a special task or office. So essentially, when Paul is talking about the fact that he is a called apostle, in all of its forms, when Paul uses it, he's talking about God's gracious, effective call to life and salvation. And in this verse, he's talking about God's successful call, not just to salvation, but also to ministry. We have all been called. We have all been called. You notice, if you will, chapter 1, verse 6. He uses the same term. And he says in verse 6, Among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. We have all been called. The amazing thing is that, that Paul here is not applying it just to his salvation, but also to his ministry, that he didn't choose this role as apostle. God called him to it. And it's always when Paul uses this term, it has to do with the efficaciousness of it. But how significant was this term to Paul? This verbal adjective, the other forms of it are used spread throughout the New Testament. The majority of the times are used by Paul. There are ten times this verbal adjective used in the New Testament. Seven of the ten times are used by Paul. Four times in Romans, three times in 1 Corinthians. This is Paul's term. Among other terms, this is Paul's term. And several things that it, that it entails for Paul is this, that it's God's gracious call. God is the one who initiates the process. God is the one who has called us. We didn't call Him. He called us. Now, generally speaking, we talk about proclaiming the gospel to the lost world. That's essentially what we're doing. We're giving God's call to the world. When we proclaim the gospel, that is what we're doing. We're giving a general call to the world. God will render that call efficacious in the life of those who respond to that call. But nonetheless, we are calling to the world to respond to God's message. And God is the initiator of this. The other thing in Paul's usage of this term has to do with God's efficacious call. In other words, the idea is that call for Paul includes the notion of response. That God called through the gospel and there was a response to that calling. We all responded. So in regards to our lives, if we are believers, God's call was efficacious in our life. And Paul doesn't get all to the details as to how this works out and how that response came about. He does it in other letters. We understand that what the, the call comes out and we receive it by faith, but that faith we also find in Philippians, that faith is also given to us by God. So unless God does something in our life to bring about transformation, we don't respond to that call. But there is a response to it. The call to those who have not only heard but have obeyed the divine call. The call then was not merely an external but an internal efficacious call upon the life. And Paul says, this is a reality in my life. Paul says, I've been effectively called by God to this ministry of apostle. And we know that that happened on the road to Damascus. Not only was that his moment of conversion, that was his moment of commission. That was the moment in which God called him to this ministry. And from that point on, he had served God in this role. He was an apostle. And I love this because you know how generally he defines himself as a slave like all the rest of the slaves in the household of God. But at the same time, there is that unique role. He's an apostle. And I just remind you, all of us have that unique role. We are all common slaves like everyone else, but yet at the same time, we have a distinct role within the household of God. Each has a distinct gift, each has a distinct role, and each must be using that gift and fulfilling that role that God has set for them. And it's not for others to dictate for us what that may be. It's for us to discover what that is and what God would have us do. It's interesting because Paul's going to use the same term, and notice in verse 6, that we talked about, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. He's going to use the same thing, with the fact that we are saints by virtue of this divine vocation that God's call in our life was efficacious, and we are called of Jesus Christ. And we'll get into the significance of that. Sometimes you want to go study 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and the times that Paul uses the term calling. Not only, that, not only is he a servant, not only is he a called apostle, he is set apart to the gospel. I had to stop here. I, to me, this was such an amazing statement that Paul makes. He deals with the fact of his master. He deals with his ministerial position. This is his main objective. This is his purpose to life. I was set apart unto the gospel. 
It's interesting because typically when Paul talks about being set apart, it's set apart from something, right? Apa, but this is not set apart from something. It's set apart ace, unto something. Unto what? Unto the gospel. The meaning of this term, the word involves to be separate from, to be marked off by boundaries, to set apart, devoted to a special purpose. Now it's interesting because this term is used in the Septuagint. Several ways it's used. It's used of setting apart to God the firstborn of men and beasts. It's used of consecrating the Levites to divine service on behalf of Israel. And it's also used of God separating Israel from the other nations to be a special possession. This is a unique thing that God does in the life of His people. In the New Testament, it's used of the setting apart of Barnabas and Saul for missionary service in chapter 13. It's used of Paul's called apostle, I mean set aside by God for a special purpose in God's sovereign plan, God's <laughs> consecration for a future task. When he talked about in Galatians 1.15 that even while I'm in my mother's womb, I've been set apart, I've been consecrated. And now we see that it's being issued of being set apart for the service and the interest of God for the gospel. I love this statement because really behind everything for Paul was this fact. This was significant for him. I mean, it was everything that drove him. He says, I'm standing in the state of being set apart unto the gospel. I mean, you just think about this. What a clarifying thing in life. I was talking about this with Ian because you were discussing Matthew 20, the Great Commission. I said, you know the thing, son? I was doing college ministry years and years ago, and there were a group of guys, and, and they seemed to have it all together. But, man, there came a period in life. And, just, they, and even when I talk to them today, they just don't know where they're going. They're still trying to discover the purpose. And I said, son, the moment you understand Matthew 20 and the Great Commission... Life is going to be easy for you in the sense of the fact that you know what you're always supposed to be doing. I said to my dad the other day, and something difficult happened, and I said, you know, the thing is, Dad, when I woke up the next morning, I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. The same thing I do every day, and it's about the gospel ministry. You see, the what never changes. The to whom and the where will always change, but the what never changes. For us as believers, the what never changes. It's always about that mandate. Make disciples. It's about the gospel ministry. Paul knew his whole life was marked by this. I've been set apart unto the gospel. Every relationship that I encounter, every situation in life, every experience, it's about the gospel. When he's sitting in prison in, in, in Rome, right, and he writes the church of Philippi, and he's talking about his situation and all the suffering that he's going through, and even that there are believers who are trying to cause him pain while he's incarcerated, and he says to them, I will rejoice. Yes, I know I'll rejoice because Jesus Christ is being proclaimed. Even then, it was all about the gospel, and that gave him perspective on life. When we realize that this is the drive of our life, it's all about the gospel, right? L.C. Astor, right, the witnessing plumber. Plumbing was a secondary thing for him. Primary gospel. Plumbing was mission field. Gospel was the reason, the purpose, the objective for it all. Wherever you go in life, the fact is the same, that we are to make disciples. It's about the gospel. The job, the neighbors, the everything else, that's secondary. No matter what encounter Paul had, he always knew the fact was he was set apart unto the gospel. I give you this quote by Mo again. He makes a statement. He is separated in Christ and for Christ. He lives apart from even the worthiest personal ambitions. Richer than ever since he was in Christ and all that makes man's nature wealthy and power to know, to will, to love, he uses all his riches always for this one thing, to make man understand the gospel of God. That's why we're here. To make known this one thing, the gospel of God. Moore goes on to say, Such isolation behind a thousand contacts is the Lord's call for His true followers still. This is the call upon our lives. Paul's not just defining his life. He's defining every life of every believer. We are slaves just as he is a slave. We have been called just as he has been called. We all have our unique role just as he had in his unique role. And we have all been set apart unto the gospel. That's why we're here. If there was no divine mandate, Matthew 28, there's no reason for being here. I mean, you want to talk about a purpose-driven life? <laughs> That's... That's the one purpose, the overriding purpose. 
It's about transformed life, but it's about transformed life to serve. It's a life of serving the gospel. It's a life of manifesting the gospel. It's a life living motivated by the mercies of God. And all of this deals with the mercies of God. I started off with talking about John Wesley, and I want to end talking about John Wesley because I find it very fascinating. Two statements, one from his own lips in regards to his life. John Wesley made this statement. He said his desire was to be on full stretch for God. <laughs> I love that. His desire is to be on full stretch for God. This man traveled all over England preaching the gospel. The churches, you know, they started banning him. They wouldn't even let him come speak in the church because he was a little unorthodox, right? So wherever he could gather a crowd, that's what he did. And it was all about the gospel message. His brother made this statement about him later on in life. And he summed up his single aim in this way. He says, to serve the present age, my calling to fulfill, oh, may it all my powers engage to do my master's will. I pray that's the same model for all of our lives. As slaves of Christ, all we desire to do is our master's will. Let's pray.